Hello everyone, this video will be an overview of my term paper, which will discuss the role cooling rate has in producing certain microstructures and mechanical properties. So cooling rate is very important in determining the properties of steel. Controlling the proper cooling rate is vital for metallurgists to yield the desired microstructure of steel and obtain the necessary strength and ductility that fulfill their given design constraints. The discussion will revolve around microstructures that result from water quenching, air cooling, and furnace cooling. It will then compare how those microstructures can be used to determine the resulting mechanical properties. So on this slide here, you can see an iron carbon phase diagram. So we're going to go over three different cooling mechanisms, water quenching, air cooling, and furnace cooling. For our discussion on the role of cooling rate, we'll look at an experiment conducted by Professor Jinan Nagi at the Iraq Institute of Technology. Steel is a combination of iron and carbon that exists between 0.05% iron carbon content all the way to 2.1% iron carbon content. The steel we're looking at today is steel 35 and all samples are actually 0.39% carbon content, which is considered hypo-eutectoid steel. So austenite solution is the starting point for most heat treatment methods and will be this for all the samples we look at today. So 0.38 weight percent carbon samples are first heated to austenite solution at 850 degrees Celsius and then held for one hour. And you can see that here by this blue point. All right, and so after that, each sample is cooled using one of the three cooling rates, which is water quenching, obviously the fastest cooling rate, and then air cooling, the second fastest cooling rate, and furnace cooling, which is the slowest cooling rate. The microstructures when undergoing cooling are mainly driven by the diffusion of carbon atoms. And this is because austenite can hold more carbon atoms in solution than ferrite can. And as you can see, you can see that here by this solid line. All right, moving on to the next slide. This image shows the resulting microstructures of the steel samples after cooling. As you can see, sample A shows the microstructure of the steel 39 before any heat treatment. Sample B shows the microstructures after being water quenched, sample C air cooled, and sample D is furnace cooled. The microstructure of group B samples right here, which underwent water quenching, are expected to consist of non-equilibrium martensite phases. Because of the high cooling rate and insufficient time for carbon atoms to diffuse from austenite solution, there is a strain buildup that distorts the lattice. The lattice then becomes a uh, body center tetragonal martensite phase, and that's due to the strain caused by the carbon atoms. This would normally be a B, uh, body center cubic phase ferrite, but it distorts the lattice and is body center tetragonal. The high strain rate in martensite phase is good for steel because it's the main source of strengthening and has high hardness. The final microstructure of the quenched steel consists of martensitic phase structure as shown here in phase 2b, and figure 2b, sorry. In comparison to the group B samples, group C samples have a lower cooling rate because it's air cooling and are expected to result in equilibrium phases in the final microstructure. The phases that result from the air cooling from austenite solution are ferrite and perlite. The point at which ferrite starts to form is denoted as X1 and is the upper critical, uh, upper critical temperature point for ferrite to begin forming. You can see that here by this top part where the tie line hits this solace line right here, that's X1. That's the upper critical temperature point. And then there's a lower critical temperature point, X2, shown just below that, which is where the carbon atoms diffuse from austenite to become ferrite in a body center cubic lattice structure. Each austenite grain becomes richer and richer in carbon as carbon diffuses from other austenite grains. Eventually, at the lower critical temperature point, there is a combination of ferrite and highly rich in carbon austenite. For a 0.39 weight percent carbon hyper-eutectoid steel, hyper-eutectoid uh, hypo steel, sorry, the expected microstructure at the lower critical temperature point, X1, is 50% austenite and 50% ferrite. Because 0.39 weight percent carbon is about halfway between the eutectoid point, which is at around 0.83 weight percent. So during the phase transformation at 723 degrees Celsius, austenite grains begin to become absorbed by ferrite in austenite, or Fe3C, uh, cementite. Ferrite and cementite grow adjacently in a lamellar or parallel-like structure to absorb the uh, rest of the austenite grains. The resulting structure is called perlite, which remains in the final microstructure during slow air cooling to, to room temperature. It is expected that the final microstructures for slow cooling will be at about 50% perlite and 50% ferrite because that 50% austenite before turns into the perlite. It gets absorbed. Um, so 
uh, and that's the, for the conditions of slow cooled steel. In figure 2C, the perlite is evident due to the light tan, and uh, you, the light tan colored nodules in ferrite is observed as the darker structures. But you can see that this is not 50% ferrite and 50% perlite. That's because air cooling was still too fast of a cooling rate to allow ferrite grains sufficient time to grow. So instead, you can see that ferrite builds up at the grain boundaries of the perlite. But as you can see in uh, figure 2b, you can see that there is 50% perlite and 50% ferrite because uh, this is furnace cooling and has an even slower cooling rate than air cooling. And so there's sufficient time for grain growth. And you can see that here in figure 2D. So in the table here on this slide, uh, you can see Professor Nagy's mechanical uh, properties testing the results from that. So as you can see, water quenching has the highest hardness and the highest strength across the board, except for, except for the impact strength. That is because it is uh, because the lattice has buildup of carbon atoms distorting it in its martensite um, phase, and that causes the strain buildup. This is like whenever you fill up a balloon and it has too much air, it is easier to pop. The less air it has, the harder it is to pop because there's less strain build up there. The air-cooled sample, however, has the second highest yield, torsion, and ultimate strength among the three cooled samples. Compared to the water quench sample, air cooling the steel allowed it to be less brittle since it has a higher impact strength. At the same time, it also has the smallest ductility, likely due to the very small grain sizes and ferrite buildup ferrite build at the grain boundaries. Lastly, for the furnace cooling, you can see that the properties are essentially the opposite of water quench. The sample has high ductility, high impact strength, but low yield and ultimate tensile strength. Furnace cooling would be a good sample to use in applications where you need a design to last a long time, susceptible to some deformation, but also bearing smaller loads. In conclusion, the best relationship we observe today is that strength and hardness is higher with large cooling rates, such as quenching. However, this increased strength comes at a loss of toughness and ductility. Understanding the resulting microstructures and how they relate to properties is very important for materials engineers in the industry because it allows them to avoid those certain microstructures that risk failure. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.